1964, Lyndon Johnson declared a war on poverty. Three years later, with poverty vanquished, Johnson proclaimed a war on crime. Two years after that, when there was no more crime, Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs. Building on the huge success of that, two years later, with drugs obviously totally vanquished, Nixon proclaimed a war on cancer. Since then, we've had the war on Christmas. We've had the war on the war on Christmas. When government scientists got their papers overwritten by Bush administration political appointees, that sort of felt like a war on science. When they started confiscating bottled water and toiletries before we got on planes, that was sort of a war on moisture. We like to declare war on things that win those wars against us. Poverty, drugs, cancer, Christmas, science, hand cream. These are all things that are not at all that susceptible to the means by which we have war fighting dominance in the world. You cannot smart bomb poverty, let alone hand cream. But as we discussed on the show earlier this week, it is one thing to declare euphemistic wars on things you can't deploy your military against. It's a whole other realm of confusing to declare that our actual military will fight wars against things that can't be defeated by military means such as declaring war, a big military war, on the feeling of being scared. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. The war on terror, the war on the feeling of being scared, quickly became even bigger and more grandiose. It became... It's a victory in the global war on terror. See, it became the global war on the feeling of being scared. The global war on terror was quickly adopted as a sort of name brand for post 9-11 military actions, even as the Bush administration itself seemed uncomfortable with it. There were a few short-lived efforts to start calling it something else. This struggle against violent extremism is going to take a long time. The global struggle against violent extremism, a global struggle against the enemies of freedom, a global struggle against the enemies of civilization. Donald Rumsfeld tried out a few different variations of this, but they never stuck. And they never stuck in part, I think, because the president at the time had his own ideas for what to call it. We actually misnamed the war on terror. It ought to be the, the, the struggle against ideological extremists who do not believe in free societies who happen to use terror as a weapon to try to shake the conscience of the free world. The struggle against ideological extremists who do not believe in free societies, societies who happen to use terror as a weapon to try to shake the conscience of the free world. I actually kind of like that one, but it never stuck. Uh, since then, we had a brief effort to recast everything as the easy to remember, easy to spell, long war. West Point has given you the skills you will need in Afghanistan and Iraq and for the long war with Islamic radicalism. The long war. It's a little esoteric, a little hopeless, a little crusade -y. never really caught on. Earlier this week, we reported that a Pentagon civil servant had emailed speechwriters and others at the Pentagon to say that there was yet a new term to get used to. Quote, OMB says this administration prefers to avoid using the term long war or global war on terror. Please use overseas contingency operation. Overseas contingency operation. Oko. And you thought the long war didn't catch on. Here's your update on this. You might have noticed that President Obama's Afghanistan announcement used a bunch of different names for what we're doing there, uh, but he never once mentioned Oko. A campaign against extremism will not succeed with bullets or bombs alone. And this is just one part of a comprehensive strategy to prevent Afghanistan from becoming the Al-Qaeda safe haven that it was before 9-11. The United States of America did not choose to fight a war in Afghanistan. So in his terms, it is a campaign, it is a comprehensive strategy, it is a war in Afghanistan. The new president doesn't appear to have picked a brand name that he's going to repeat a lot. But it turns out that inside the government, inside the Obama administration, where the rubber hits the road in terms of how things get funded and resourced and compared to other things, Oko might actually be for real. This is Jeff Morrell. He's the Pentagon spokesman. When he was questioned about this what to call the wars thing this week, he said nobody's telling him what to call anything from the podium at the Pentagon. He said there is no mandate on what brand name he's supposed to use. He says as a Pentagon spokesman, he doesn't even have any preferred nomenclature for the wars, nor has one been pushed on him. Hmm. 
However, he says inside the government, I think that is an actual that is the 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 new way of referring to war spending is that overseas contingency it's still new to me so let me get it right oh go oh go oh go overseas contingency operations budget this is a budget term i mean this is this is this replaces supplementals but it's not just a uh, um, uh, this is not a matter of semantics. There is a difference here. There is actually a difference here. Hold on, wait a minute. There's actually something important and smart going on here. The Obama administration apparently isn't playing rebrand the war with new catchy public slogans all the time the way the Bush administration did. They haven't even told the Pentagon spokesman that he has to use some specific terminology. But they have changed the way that we are paying for the wars and making decisions about the wars. Instead of those emergency supplemental war requests that came in like every quarter for nearly eight years under Bush, like every three months it was a complete surprise that we were still at war and we needed to fund those wars in an emer as an emergency, totally separate from every other budget request we were considering. So they were never compared and balanced against any other needs and priorities of the country, let alone the military. Well, now the wars are OCO, overseas contingency operations, that get funded alongside all the regular stuff in the budget, which means there's actually a debate about the merits of that spending alongside all the other things that are competing for the same money. OCO, overseas contingency operation. Turns out it is not a new bumper sticker slogan for what used to be called the war on terror. Turns out it is a recognition that this is a huge monetary commitment that our country has been making for years now, and we're likely to keep making for years, and we ought to stop pretending that we are paying for it with monopoly money. You can call it the war on silly putty for all I care if it means that we're actually going to level with ourselves about what we're doing, what it's costing us, and whether we might not be better off spending that stuff on something else. I think that's okay. Also, I just like saying oko. Okay. So now we know the new president's plan for what has been thought of in this country as the other war for about six years now. The new plan actually involves us in two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, indefinitely. There's no end date. So let the debate begin as to whether or not we as a country agree with President Obama about his new approach to this old war. What isn't up for debate is the fact that the Americans sent to execute this new plan will be largely the same Americans who have been waging our wars for the last eight and a half years running. Their lives will remain in peril, their families will continue to miss them, and the number of Americans who can call themselves combat veterans will continue to rise, as will our responsibility as a country to make good on the promises we make to our veterans in exchange for them volunteering to serve. This all means a recommitment to our veterans as well. That's our show for tonight.